This video talks about the nephron physiology of PCT. But before we get into the little details about how it really works in PCT, we have to remember that about 70% that enters PCT gets reabsorbed back. Most of the substance get reabsorbed back in the PCT and PCT has the highest amount of reabsorption than anywhere else in the nephron. Okay, so the first um, the first symporter that I want to talk about is the sodium and the glucose symporter. So why am I calling it symporter? Because they move in the same direction, okay? So this symporter is going to take in sodium and glucose inside the PCT. By the way, this is the lumen, this is the interstitium, and here we have all the substances that gets filtered onto the PCT and it gets reabsorbed back onto the cell and onto the interstitium which goes back to the blood. Now the first symporter is sodium and glucose. Now about, about two-thirds of the sodium gets reabsorbed back at the level of PCT. So when sodium gets reabsorbed back, what follows? The things that follow sodium is going to be water, it's going to be potassium, it's going to be chloride. Those things are reabsorbed back at the level of PCD as well, along with sodium. The second antiport that I want to talk about is sodium hydrogen antiport. So again, sodium is taken in and hydrogen is it's coming out through this antiport. This antiport is acted on by angiotensin 2. Okay? This antiport is going to cause the sodium to get in and hydrogen to come out. Now this hydrogen ion can get excreted in the urine and our urine is acidic or it can combine with a bicarb. It can combine with a bicarb to form a weak acid called H2CO3 or carbonic acid. Now this carbonic acid can again dissociate into water and carbon dioxide but it does not happen spontaneously. This happens with the help of an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase which converts this acid into water and carbon dioxide. Now this water and carbon dioxide it then goes back onto our PCT. So now we have carbon dioxide and water in our PCT which then combines to form H2CO3 and here we have carbonic anhydrase and H2CO3 then again spontaneously dissociates to form hydrogen and bicarb. Okay? And then the process continues and again the hydrogen comes out in exchange of sodium. So our primary concern is that we don't want to lose osmolarity, so we want to get rid of the sodium. It's okay if we leave if we let go a little bit of hydrogen. So that's the whole idea, but the hydrogen is reabsorbed back. Now, you might be thinking that if we are getting rid of all the hydrogen, then what happens to the osmolarity of the serum? Well, the hydrogen is getting back onto the system through this method. Or um Pretty much this is how the pH of the serum is determined because uh, depending on how much is reabsorbed back and how much is let go, it determines the pH of our serum. A lot of the time, 90% uh, of the bicarb is going to be absorbed back. Um, sometimes hydrogen is, the hydrogen ion is buffered with the help of ammonia which is also being produced in the, at the level of PCT. At this point, I would like to mention that um, since two-thirds of the sodium, two-thirds of the water, and the potassium, and the chloride, 90% of the bicarb, most of the hydrogen, reabsorbed back at the level of PCT. So the osmolarity of blood entering PCT and at the end of, uh, at the end of PCT, the blood that is remain remaining in the in this in our blood vessels the osmolarity of the blood is not going to be very different because most of the things that came out at the level of 
PCT were reabsorbed back and that is why it, at the reabsorption of, um, of these substances at the level of PCT is going to be isotonic reabsorption. because most of the substances are being reabsorbed back onto the PCT, not changing the osmolarity of the serum significantly. Okay, now there is uh, something else I'd like to talk about here. I'd like to talk about um, a drug uh, which inhibits our carbonic anhydrase, and I want to talk about what exactly hap happens when we inhibit carbonic anh anhydrase. So that drug is going to be called acetazolamide. Now, what is the clinical use of acetazolamide? I use a mnemonic called A-GUM, okay? A-GUM, A for altitude, G for glaucoma, U for urinary alkalosis, and M for metabolic alkalosis. What I mean by that is we use acetazolamide to make urine alkaline, and to make plasma or serum acidotic, to make them acidotic. Okay? Um, okay, so, so how can it make urine and alkaline? So pay attention here that if we, if we block this drug, if we block our carbonic anhydrase, this is not going to make our water and carbon dioxide from uh, from our weak carbonic acid, so we're going to be left with H2CO3. So how can we have, how can we cause uh, metabolic alkalosis when we're using acetazolamide, when we're left with H2CO3, which is going to get now become part of the urine? The, the answer to this puzzle is bicarbonate is a stronger base than H2CO3. H2C3 is a very weak acid, but bicarb is a stronger base than that weak acid. So what happens through equilibrium, this, uh, this re reaction is going to go backwards and form H2CO3, HCO3 or bicarb. And the, the electrolyte that we're going to lose when we inhibit carbonic anhydrase is going to be bicarbonate. That's going to get trickled down the system and we are going to lose our bicarb and that's why we use acetazolamide for urinary to create urinary alkalosis because that bicarb will not be uh, reabsorbed back the bicarb will not be able to um, form water and carbon dioxide because bicarb combines with hydrogen to form H2CO3 and H2CO3 is acted on by carbonic anhydrase to form water and carbon dioxide which then absorbs back so if this process is stopped it gets stuck at the level of H2CO3, and when the level of H2CO3 kind of rises, just by equilibrium, it shuttles back to form more bicarb, and that bicarb, bicarb gets excreted through the urine. And that's, why, that's how we can have uh, metabolic, um, sorry, urinary alkalosis by using acetazolamide.